Um, that brings me to uh, Marcus Brand. Uh, Marcus, you've been very vocal and you've been monitoring the news and developments related to the military's polls. Um, could you tell us what broadly are the military's plans and how far are these plans from the internationally recognized standards of the free and fair election? <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I would uh, like to propose to start uh, by zooming out and reminding ourselves in which context we are even talking about this upcoming electoral exercise. Uh, we are in a situation where we are two years into an unconstitutional coup that was clearly and loudly condemned by the international community all the way up to the UN General Assembly. And that unconstitutional coup followed an election held in November 2020 that was widely seen as reflecting the will of the people of the country, even though we, score, of course, all remember the shortcomings of that election. But it was, by and large, a reflection of the will of the people of Myanmar, and it was recognized as such by people inside the country and outside. Following the coup, which I'm not going to go into detail about why it was unconstitutional and how it was unconstitutional, but, but it, that is clearly established. Uh, we also had the illegal and invalid cancellation of the 2020 election result by an illegally constituted so-called Union Election Commission that is now physically occupying the UEC building in Nipita. That in itself did not have any constitutional basis. Uh, neither the formality nor the merits uh, justified this act of cancelling the 2020 election results. Instead, we actually have a rec relatively recognized uh, parliament in the form of the CRPH that constituted itself a few days after the coup and has in the meantime uh, had many, many meetings bilaterally with parliaments and interparliamentary organizations around the world, including most recently the Interparliamentary Union Assembly in Manama in Bahrain. The IPU considers the CRPH the representative of the parliament of Myanmar, and so do many other parliaments around the world. And of course, we have the statements by the UN General Assembly and the Security Council that uh, demand the reinstituting re that elected parliament. If you want to know more about the details of why exactly the regime in Epito is illegitimate and illegal, I strongly recommend you to read Tom Andrews' uh, brilliant uh, paper uh, that we published, uh, that we presented in New York at the end of January. Uh, that also lays out clearly how the regime is struggling to maintain control uh, across the country. So starting with the unconstitutionality, the regime has dug itself deeper and deeper into illegality and unconstitutionality, and there is simply no way out. The 2008 constitution is can be considered defunct because it has lost its moral legitimacy. Uh, and uh, the military itself has been moving the goalpost repeatedly, extending the deadline that even the state of emergency provisions, let's assume, you know, the state of emergency was constitutional. Even if you look at those provisions, the uh, military has now moved the deadline beyond all uh, possible uh, interpretation of the wording simply by arguing necessity. And whenever regimes uh, start arguing with necessity, you know that constitutionalism has lost, has been lost completely. So essentially what we have here is a regime that is seeking to organize an electoral exercise as a way out that is essentially an Orwellian psyops attempt to complete continue and consolidate the coup. So this electoral exercise is nothing else than part of the coup itself. It is the process that began with the coup and it must therefore be equally uh, condemned and not assisted in the same way as you wouldn't assist the coup itself. And that is also why IDEA, international idea, 
has taken the quite unusual um, position as an intergovernmental organization supporting elections and democracy uh, to not even consider this an election. We are not talking about whether it's not a free and fair election. We don't even consider it an election, and we also do not list it in our global uh, elections database uh, that uh, lists all electoral events uh, around the world. And we have made a statement together with a few other organizations that are committed to the Declaration of Principles for an International Election Observation that we published on the 31st of January, uh, that is together with NDI, UNFRAIL, uh, also, the Club de Madrid uh, supported this. Uh, several other renowned international election actors also supported this statement, but preferred not to make this public. And in this statement, we very clearly uh, distanced ourselves from this electoral exercise. Now, what we actually have, and, you know, Thompson, I'm I want, I'm getting a bit nervous when you say we've been monitoring this election. We are not monitoring, we're, we're obviously following the events, but we certainly do not consider this anything anywhere remotely like an election observation. Uh, but we, of course, follow what's been happening, and we now know that uh, 52 political parties until yesterday have uh, applied for uh, re registration. There is also a process of redistricting going on because the military has finally figured out how to gerrymander uh, uh, electoral districts for its uh, own advantage. Uh, and there is talk about a uh, change to a PR system, uh, which of course has been discussed, that is proportional representation uh, from a very uh, classical first past the post system, which Myanmar has practiced for many years. Uh, but the uh, I would say we have also published a, a paper on this uh, back in November that explains how this dangling this proportionality in front of uh, especially ethnic parties is a misleading effort to uh, gain their support, but would not actually uh, necessarily uh, increase the, the representation or the chances of smaller parties to be represented in, 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 in an elected body that comes out of such a system. So what are the glaring faults if we, if we even uh, look at this as something like an election? Well, first of all, that the parties that won almost 90% of the seats in the 2020 elections are excluded from this exercise. Another thing we have to note here is that, of course, also the Rohingya are excluded from this electoral exercise. And we all remember the controversies around the exclusion of Rohingya in 2020. And that, of course, has not come, become any better under the current circumstances. So anybody who wants to support a reintegration and rehabilitation of Rohingya must, of course, also demand that Rohingya and Rohingya uh, candidates must be able to fully uh, participate in any genuine democratic election uh, in the future. And then, of course, we have, you know, the lack of control uh, of the military over large parts of the country uh, or contested control, which means that no proper election could be held. But even where there is relative uh, calm and safety, I hear uh, it's uh, supposedly quite calm in Golden Valley in Yangon these days, but uh, there are other parts that have a, a uh, let's say, a, a veneer of normality, but underneath a climate of fear that certainly does not allow the freedom of expression uh, and the uh, open competition for uh, political mandate that you would expect from an electoral environment. So the outcome of uh, this exercise in the eyes of the military is some kind of fake parliament as a state show of uh, legitimate government. Uh, but uh, we have already made very clear that, uh, at least from our perspective, we would not recognize such a parliament uh, that would come out from such an exercise. I would also like to come back to uh, some text here, even though this may sound a bit boring to read this, uh, but the UN General Assembly in June 21, 
on has actually made it very clear what still actually is the baseline for what the international community should be asking for. In its resolution that was very broadly supported in the UN General Assembly, the uh, GA asked, uh, called upon the Myanmar armed forces to respect the will of the people as freely expressed by the results of the general election of 8 November 2020, to end the state of emergency, to respect all human rights of all people of Myanmar, and to allow the sustained democratic transition of Myanmar, including the opening of the democratically elected parliament of, of November 2020, and by working towards bringing all national institutions, including the armed forces, uh, under fully inclusive civilian government that is representative of the will of the people. And this is quite extraordinary because here the UN General Assembly essentially asked for constitutional change of Myanmar, asked for a significant revision of the terms of the 2008 constitution, which exactly do not foresee such a civilian control and oversee, oversight of the armed forces. So the, uh, the General Assembly actually went further than asking for an end of the coup, end of the state of emergency, and then reinstallment of the parliament, but actually asked also for bringing the armed forces under civilian control. And this call was repeated by the UN Security Council Resolution 2669 of December last year, which also urged the Myanmar military, not the state of Myanmar notably, to immediately release all arbitrarily detained prisoners, including quote, President Win Mint and State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi. So the UN Security Council in a binding resolution, it's not enforceable under Chapter 7, but it's still binding on the international community, still considers President Win Mint the head of state of that country and the elections as valid and asks for an immediate end of the state of emergency. What does the Myanmar military do instead? ignore this, completely deny any of this, uh, and go ahead with its preparations for its so-called elections. As I said, the 52 political parties that have already registered until yesterday uh, are interesting to look at a bit more closely. You might have the impression of 52 political parties, that's quite a lot of, you know, high number, you know, maybe this is actually representative, but let's have a look. Eight of these 52 are newly established, 42, 44 of them uh, already existed before. But even of these, uh, one has to also note what, what the military is trying to do is to organize an election, not only for a union parliament, but also for the state and region parliaments, because according to the 2008 constitution, all of these elections take place at the same time. So when we're talking about seats here, we're talking about seats in the two union uh, houses, the Amyota Luta and the Pitu Luta, but also in the 14 state and region assemblies. And of these uh, 52 political parties that registered, only 12 parties uh, signed up to compete at the union level. The, only the other 40 will uh, participate only on the state and region level. Of these 52, 42 never won a seat in elections before. Only 10 parties of these 52 won some seats in the 2020 elections. Altogether, about 19 parties won seats in the 2020 elections. And 10 of these are now among these 52 that uh, registered. But these 10 together won 125 seats, that is 11% of the totally elected seats in 2020 at both union and state and region level. So these 52 parties at maximum represent something like a tenth of the uh, uh, people that were selected as their representatives back in 2020. Um, 
Well, I should also say that back in 2020, it was quite significant that despite the cancellation in a number of constituencies, 95% uh, of all seats could be elected. That was uh, 1,117 out of 1,171. So 95% of the seats at union and state and region level were actually elected and are still uh, considered actually in uh, by uh, by the uh, electorate as uh, as holding their mandates. The last thing I want to say is that uh, we also conducted a survey at the end of last year inside Myanmar with the uh, respected uh, survey company that preferred not to have its name mentioned, but it, they know how to do their job, and they uh, found that of all organizations and entities. The NLD maintains the highest rank in terms of favorability. 76% uh, of all respondents said that they hold a uh, favorable or very favorable, favorable view of the NLD. Similarly high levels for the PDF, ethnic armed organizations, and the interim institutions, in particular the ranking of EAOs was quite significant because that includes a large majority also of people in the uh, central Myanmar lowlands. And the large majority also supported the uh, 2020, the validity of the 2020 elections and did not want to repeat uh, the election under the military's terms. Uh, most people support a change of the 2008 constitution and want to get rid of uh, dictatorship and want to have genuine federal democracy. And that is what we are trying to support together with our peers and partners in the international community. We are urging all of the member states of international idea, but also others and other organizations to not even provide any technical material or symbolic support to the sham elections organized by the military, uh, because we believe that under the current circumstances, it is impossible to hold a genuine democratic election. Uh, and uh, that reflects the will of the people of Myanmar. Thank you. Um, I think the next one, I, maybe can, I, I can ask Marcus. We have a question about, I mean, we talked about, obviously there's, um, very overwhelming popular opposition to this uh, to this move by the military, um, but all, we also see some likely actors taking part in this show, um, in terms of politicians like Uto Huji and Dedet Khan, who is now the Junta's social welfare minister, um, and some of the ethnic parties perhaps. Um, who do you think are likely to get involved in Myanmar, and uh, do you see any strategy from the USDP? Well, I think the uh, strategy is quite obvious in the sense that it's sort of back to the roots of being a, a, uh, you know, a willing uh, part of the military establishment. And uh, maybe I can also add to, to you know, when I mentioned the, um, the parties of these 52 political parties that registered until yesterday, that all together won 125 seats back in 2020. Of those 125, 71 were USDP seats. So let's say among these registering parties, the USDP is maybe the biggest. Um, then the uh, Pao National Organization, the Mon Unity Party, and the Arakan National Party are all above like 11, 12, and 15 seats, respectively, and all the others had less than one seat, or well, less than 10 seats, some of them only one. So we're talking about a relatively small uh, segment of, if you can consider that even the political party spectrum, uh, and with the USDP clearly being, you know, the only national party that, you know, you can even consider that a political party, but it is an extension of the military system that is more than just a, a military that has taken over uh, government institutions by force, but it is sort of the, the 
the entire military establishment that is uh, sort of reasserting itself through this. And uh, it is really about, not just about, you know, constantly you know, setting up a new parliament, but it is for, uh, the fundamental question of whether the, the, the expression of, of the will of the people of Myanmar that has been repeatedly very, very clear in 1990, in 2012, in 2015, and in 2020, then whenever the people are being asked, they basically say they don't want to be able to the military. And that is the fundamentally what the military refuses to accept. And um, that's why, you know, all of these detailed discussions about military selections in Oslo will really take place this year, next year, and with the Laos, South Sea, and Chairmanship, and all these kind of details, it's actually beside the point. The, the central point is whether the international community sells out the people of Myanmar to a new server that has taken over government by force, uh, and, in, you know, to, for some short-term um, uh, gain of, of you know practical arrangements or infrastructure projects or, or whatever it may be or for peace of mind in in Bone Valley, but uh, it is fundamentally clear that you know whether people support the NLD or not, and I don't want to sound too much as a pro NLD figure here, but it is very clear that the NLD re remains the most the strongest political force in the country, especially. Uh, among the majority population, but not only uh, one should add. And uh, there, but there are also many others. And and I would also like to say that when you draw these historical parallels, it's also important to see what's different this time. Uh, and you know, the, I spoke about the let's say the insistence on the 2020 elections results, but that is you know leading us a bit into constitutional uncharted territory because at the same time we say the 2008 constitution is gone so how can there still be a, an electoral ballot on the urban election that, is, that took place under that and there you have to basically say that this was a, a, a political mandate that has transformed into something else and that's why it's important that these elected MPs are not claiming to be the sole representative of that don't have the monopoly of representation of the people, but they have joined forces with other groups in the NUCC, not that it's easy as we all know, but this is quite significant and quite significantly different from historical precedent, that they have come together with these other forces to share power in a collective exercise of, of decision-making. And that is uh, why also I think there is a particular strength in this uh, in this effort, and not only that, this is not only about regaining power, but this is really about rebuilding the country as a genuine democracy, as also laid down in the roadmap on the principles in the Federal Democracy Charter, that and, and the policies stated by the NUG, like even Rohingya rehabilitation, that I think it's you know, the international community should look at what is coming next in Myanmar, not just as how do we make sure that this, this, so there is peace and quiet, but how do we use this opportunity for this country to finally get out of its 70, 80 years of miserable history to establish proper, proper popular rule by the people and, and where everybody, regardless of ethnicity, religion, can feel at home and, and not, dis not discriminated. And that is the promise that these interest institutions have made. And there, and, and I think we should take them by, by their word and, and support them. And that includes having an election whenever the time is right, but a, a proper fair election, one that is inclusive, one that is properly based on fundamental rights, on, on, on freedom of expression, freedom of association, assembly, etc. There is absolutely no point in, in organizing an election, even if the military went out of power tomorrow, it would be pointless to have an election in the next few months. The situation is far too fragile and far too uh, unstable to have any kind of proper uh, uh, de democratic electoral exercise in all parts of the country. So one has to be very pragmatic on finding solutions, but solutions that don't extend the, the, the problem that brought us here, which is military claim to rule against the will of the people, but actually overcoming that as Placid Biromi always says in his uh, very good statements, 
uh, and getting the military to accept that uh, this time is up now and that the people no longer support this. And we appeal to the international community that uh, they should support this very clear uh, call by the people uh, for, for assistance in this regard. Uh, let me also, since I have the floor, thank Mary for uh, raising this whole issue of, of violence, whether you call it electoral violence or other kind of violence. And I, I also want to be very clear that even though we may condemn this electoral exercise as illegitimate, but we do not condemn any individual who may be also forced, coerced to participate in this exercise, whether it's as voters, as electoral officials, or even as political parties. I think these political parties that some of them that had to register with the threat of uh, otherwise uh, uh, prohibition and dissolution. It's not an easy choice to make. Huh? Uh, so I think one has to be very careful and I appeal very strongly also to all people in Myanmar to uh, not um, confuse a legitimate right of self-defense against indiscriminate violence, which certainly exists with uh, random violence against uh, activities that are you know intended to uh, um, to stage show an election but i don't think that uh, any election officials or polling stations make legitimate targets for this uh, movement if it wants to be a democratic revolution the question i would like to ask is should the international community and by that i mean your governments ngos the un should they be engaging with the junta to negotiate a settlement, a way out of this in some way? Or um, even if the end point is you know, complete civilian control over the military at some point, do you negotiate with the military to get to that end point? Or do you just basically demand total surrender and support the opposition? Um, and the Burma Act, one would think, is actually a step forward in that direction, is it not, where the American administration is at least recognizing support for the opposition is legitimate, even if it's not military aid. So I, I'd like to ask Marcus, do you think the international community should be doing this? And then I could... So I would like to say that there are several people in this room who are probably better placed to answer your question because they are professional diplomats and think about these things. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I, I have already made it clear what me personally, but also our organization would like to see in the sense of not supporting the sham elections exercise in any way. Uh, it is not to us to say what diplomats in Yangon and Nipita or visiting politicians or special envoys should be saying or talking to them. We're trying to support as much as we can through factual information, through giving our advice, reference to international standards, but this is really beyond our, you know, scope in a way to um, to address. But I, I, I would like to add that it's not just because we don't we have a certain preference for an outcome. I just don't believe that negotiating with the military some sort of new uh, power sharing deal or new transition deal will actually achieve the desired result. I think it's a complete uh, uh, delusion to think that, that the military can be talked into reason and all of a sudden accepting uh, that uh, it will have to transition out of power over time. I think uh, um, that uh, they need to be very, as told as clearly as the people of Myanmar have told them by the international community that they no longer have any legitimate role to govern. And uh, I think the people of Myanmar have been very, very clear over the last two years and have sacrificed and have paid a huge price. And therefore, I believe the, the minimum of the international community not even talking about responsibility to protect and things like that, but the minimum is to to not undercut that very clear demand from the people and to not try to uh, delude ourselves that by uh, agreeing on some sort of a deal with the military 
regime in Nepitor, we can all of a sudden switch towards a, a peaceful um, path to stability. I, I just don't see that. I just cannot really comprehend anybody arguing that. And that is also why it's interesting when we argue against this, this electoral exercise, because I actually have not, Thompson just tried very hard to do some homework and do some devil's advocate, but it's actually really hard to argue for these elections. And I haven't even seen anybody. I've talked to many diplomats from countries that kind of have a bit of a soft spot for this for this scenario, but even they can't give me a proper argument why that is better. It's just that it's easier than confronting the military. That's why it's you know accepted as sort of a a, a practical or realistic way forward. Uh, Marcus, would you like to uh, kick off? So on the first question, what uh, public position uh, should the interim institutions take on violence against activities related to these sham elections? I think uh, Acting President Dubois Lashila has already made a quite clear statement. I think uh, it should be repeated and even more clear that uh, when these interim institutions resort to the right of self-defense in their in their armed struggle, so like, like as the EAOs would also do, uh, to legit to basically legitimately uh, legitimately, uh, legitimately uh, deploy violence. This cannot uh, extend to uh, civilian bystanders, in, innocent victims, and and randomly attack anybody. It's the same discussion, similar also with CDMers uh, and within the CDM movement. I think. Well, one has to look very carefully into what is what are the boundaries here, and uh, when exercising you know, violent resistance as a last resort, you have to really know exactly, you know, be sure that this is really uh, uh, justified uh, in the extreme circumstances. Um, I think when, but when it comes to the question of what other, what else should the interim institutions do, I think it's important important to followed with that question because the interim institution should not only take a reactive stance to this uh, electoral narrative put out by the by the military but should actually really try to genuinely be the best government possible and that also means for the NUG for example to work with local structures under the EAOs uh, and wherever communities organize themselves and to be to actually live up to the promise of the federal democracy charter, to be inclusive, responsive, uh, accountable government, even in this interim period, to move ahead with the uh, work on a transitional constitution and towards uh, a genuine federal democratic union in the future. I think the people, I mentioned this survey before, uh, we, we quite clearly see that a lot of people in Myanmar actually support this overall move towards a more inclusive uh, society, towards uh, more accountable institutions, but most of them have not heard about the Federal Democracy Charter. So in a way, they intuitively support what's in the Federal Democracy Charter, but they don't actually know what these interim institutions are doing and what this is all about. So I think communication is an important element here as well. And on voter turnout, I think one has to be very careful to even use such a term uh, in this context because, I mean, the military could, in an extreme case, force 100% you know, of the people at gunpoint to go and vote. That would not be a voter turnout. I mean, you can't use a term from a, from a normal electoral uh, context to compare this with uh, with this kind of exercise. So a lot of people who would turn out to vote would be forced, would be compelled, would be somehow uh, manipulated into doing it, and it's very hard to tell why exactly anybody would turn out. Then, of course, it's a big question of even if people are forced into polling stations, what do they actually do with the ballot? And there is, of course, many ways of you know, even, you know, pretending to participate to turn out, but then throwing an invalid ballot. And then, but then of course, there are many ways of manipulating that as well. So, so it, it one has to be very careful in, 
in not falling into the trap of the narrative of the framing of this being any kind of moral reaction. And uh, the vote turnout in the 2020 elections was actually quite significantly high with about 72% despite the COVID situation. And so it was in most part of the parts of the country a quite a remarkable turnout. And therefore also, I think one can have confidence uh, to a large uh, extent in the electoral result of 2020.